Uh, as was mentioned, we're focused on the topic of goodness this morning. Oops. Okay, there we go. Uh, in our, we have this daily reading thing I mentioned, and in there are daily readings on the topic of goodness. Twice this week, uh, Psalm 23, verse 6 showed up. And uh, so I want to focus on that. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. And uh, that was Thursday's passage, it was Sunday's passage, and I went and looked for that, so an image for that. I found this cute little puppy. Isn't that guy cute? Kids? Is that easy cute? So you got it like with cookies. You don't know whether a dog's good or not until you got them with you at home for a while. Anyways, that's I divert. Uh, divert. Uh, Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Two times we had that passage this week. This week, I also did a funeral uh, for Karen's mom, Ida Van Sweet. Some 10 years ago, Karen chose Psalm 23 to be the passage focused on at her memorial service. And uh, little did she know at the time that I would be doing her uh, worship or her funeral, but, and that I'd also be preaching on the topic here of goodness, that we'd be studying the topic of goodness uh, during the same week as her funeral. But I'm sure that God did. So loaded with Psalm 23, verse 6, I went to the meeting on Monday with Karen's kids to plan the details of her service. I was blessed to find out that she had chosen this text, but a little bit discouraged to find out some of the details of her life. Her life was all not, not all cute little puppies. In fact, uh, as I listened to the details as described by her children, uh, it didn't seem like goodness and love had followed her all the days of her life, but badness and loss. Let me give you some of the details. Ida in Sweden contracted polio at age five, and that shriveled up her feet so that she would never run again. Now, polio isn't often heard of anymore. Uh, one of our presidents, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, suffered from polio, but that's not something we hear about much these days, but that was her experience at age five. At age 16, she lost her mom. She was one of 14 children, and um, uh, when mom passed, uh, the kids were sort of farmed out to different aunts and uncles and people from the church, that sort of thing, till dad could get back on his feet. Dad died three years, three years later. And so as growing up, a lot of those kids didn't know each other very well until they were adults because they were all in different families. Her husband died 30 years before she did. She had to bury Harold. And then only a few years ago, she had to bury her son, Larry. Now, some of you may remember Larry. Larry and Alice uh, worshipped with us for a while here at Pathway. When she was about 60, uh, she lost her ability to breathe well on her own and had to carry around an oxygen bottle with her because of her emphysema. So a lot of her circumstances were about badness and loss. And so why at her funeral did she choose a verse about proclaiming that goodness and love had followed her all the days of her life? That may be a question that you struggle with as well, because a lot of people do. It takes on different uh, hues, if you will. Uh, sometimes the question is asked this way, why do bad things happen to good people? There's been books written about that. Uh, articles and magazines and talk shows and uh, people in the church, people outside of the church. It's a big question that people struggle with. Since we're talking about the theme of goodness this morning, uh, I'm going to state the question this way. How can we talk about God's goodness when things often seem so bad? How can we talk about God's goodness when things often seem so bad? It's easy to talk about God's goodness when things go great. There are sometimes you hear about these inexplicable avoidance of di disaster, like uh, somebody's, it's a terrible snowstorm, somebody's uh, got to go home, but uh, unusually uh, they have an errand they have to run and they got to get that thing done, and so they, they don't take their usual way home. And on their usual way home, there's a 20 car pileup and there's a bunch of fatalities, and because they went home a different way that day, they avoided that catastrophe. And then they'll often say, God is so good. Wow, God was so good to you. Or people will say to them. 
Or for instance, uh, uh, guys in the airport has a scheduling mix up and uh, uh, is late to the airport, misses his flight, and later finds out that that flight went down and everybody on that flight was lost. And people will say to him, wow, God was so good to you. It's easy to say when circumstances are good. But what do we say in the same circumstances uh, when there's a different guy who thought, you know, with the snowstorm being so bad, instead of taking the side roads, they might not be as clear. They're probably clear out the expressway first, took the expressway home, gets in the pile up, and dies. What do we say to his spouse? What do we say to his wife? Or the lady who wants to catch that early flight home and finds out she can because some guy missed his flight and she catches that early flight and that plane goes down. What do we say to her husband? Or what do we say to uh, Bert and Elizabeth Bursma when their five-year-old daughter Ida contracts polio? What do we say then? Do we say to the spouses or the parents, maybe God isn't good? That's one option, right? Or, God forbid, do we say to people in that circumstance that maybe the circumstance is just, they're not too bad? Clearly, Ida didn't choose Psalm 23 for her funeral because her life circumstances were all good. She didn't choose Psalm 23 for her funeral because she thought it would be an easy event for her friends and family to attend. But see, there's more to her life than just the bad circumstances that I told you about. Ida's life bore testimony to a good God who was present with her all the days of her life despite her troubles. So to begin answering or addressing our question, let's take a look at Ida's chosen passage. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet water. Sounds pretty good, doesn't it? Sounds nice. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. That all sounds pretty good. But the next part doesn't sound so good. Walking through the valley of the shadow of death, having a table set in the presence of my enemies? Those don't sound very good. Sound very good to you? Well, let's take a closer look at the text. Verse 4 says, even though. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Even though. I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod, your staff, they comfort me. It's you that prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. God, if you're setting the table, I don't care where it is. I'm trusting you. Ida's passage talks about a God who is good, not circumstances who, that are good. That a God that is good regardless of, of the circumstances. Psalm 46, verses 1 and 2, is a song we're going to be singing at the end of this service. Uh, it's a song that we've memorized in the past. Our praise team has a song for it. It says similar thing. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in times of trouble. Ever-present. Regardless of the circumstances, God is there. That's why we call God good. So when Ida proclaimed, surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, she was saying that a good God had followed her with his love and his attention and his presence all the days of her life, regardless of her circumstances. So getting back to our question, where are we at? How can we talk about God's goodness when things often seem so bad? Well, first of all, we must acknowledge bad circumstances. The psalm talks about valleys and enemies. They're bad things. Bad happens. When people get killed in airplane crashes or car, highway crashes, it's a bad thing. When daughters contract polio or, or bone cancer or you lose a, a son or daughter or a spouse, it's 
bad. Whether one believes in God or not, most people will agree that this world is full of badness and brokenness. Regardless of how we understand to, or how we seek to understand evil through religious uh, ideas or philosophy or theology, regardless of how we try to understand evil, we need to not minimize the badness. Because I think most people will agree, and this can be a lead-in for us to minister to people, in the church or outside of the church, things are not as they are supposed to be. Amen? Things in this world are not as they are supposed to be. As believers, we know the cause is related either to God's curse on sin or our own sin and the consequences of our own sin. The world has not much good to offer us. God has put a curse on this world of sin. It's called original sin or depravity. And that makes things not good. But then there's the consequences of our own selfish behavior that brings bad things upon us. And so if we can understand that the world only has bad to offer us, and the consequences of our behavior brings us bad, then we can stand in amazement when anything good happens. And we can be very, very grateful people for the good in our lives. First, we must acknowledge bad circumstances, but then also that God is the goodness. He's the ever-present help in times of trouble, whether circumstances are bad or good. So that's what we got so far. Third, we also have to realize that God does have purpose in suffering when bad things happen. If we go back to the text, we see about the rod and the staff. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Now, uh, if you're a sheep, you don't want to get poked by the rod. But if the shepherd's rod keeps you from falling off the cliff, that's a good thing. Or if the shepherd's crook can rescue you from a stuck spot where you keep you from falling off the cliff. Or the shepherd might poke you away from that plant that he knows is not good for his sheep to eat. And the sheep will just go on eating. The sheep doesn't like to get poked at the time, but the shepherd's saving the sheep's life. Same thing with parents. We as children don't like to get poked. But sometimes our parents are keeping us from running in the road or from touching the hot stove or hanging out with friends that are not good for us. No child likes discipline at the time, says the Scripture. But the Scripture also says the parent who doesn't discipline their child doesn't love their child. One of the best things we can teach our kids in this culture is the word no. No. That's not good for you. Sometimes it's not pleasant, but it's good. I found an article that has a whole list of things, and I'm going to quickly go over this just because I think it's a great resource. Uh, if you're interested in this, some come and see me afterwards. But the question, the, why do bad things happen to good people, often assumes that God never has good reasons for suffering, but according to Scripture, God does have such reasons. I'm going to read you a bunch of them, uh, whether we dislike or understand them or not. Suffering can be due to the fallen state of creation. Just mention that, and the passages are up there again. If you want to see these later, let me know. Suffering can be a punishment for sin, though not always. God can permit Satan to inflict it. I like this idea, this metaphor, that Satan is on God's leash, and he can only go so far. Yet suffering can display God's justice. Suffering can drive sinners to repentance. It can be used to advance God's kingdom and to sanctify us. And indeed, the most stunning instance of a bad thing happening to a good person, the death of Jesus, accomplished the greatest good, the good of salvation. And then there are those times where we just don't see any reason in it. Sometimes when facing the most gratuitous and inexplicable of evils, we can only trust that God's ways are beyond our own. Isaiah 55 is there. Um, we often talk about also Romans 8, 28. Uh, uh, for all things work together for good for those who uh, are called according to God's good purpose. Um, and, you know, that's, 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 a, 
this idea of God's sovereignty, of God being in control, of God using and leveraging and not wasting things that happen to us that are painful. So anyways, uh, that's one way we can talk about God's goodness when things also seem so bad. Number four, our circumstances are not all bad. The psalm talks about our cup running over, that kind of thing. There's a bunch of things that I highlighted in the psalm that are good. He leads me, he guides me, he is with me, he comforts me, my cup overflows. We have lots of good things. Most of us came here uh, having slept on a bed last night. Most of us have eaten well this week. Most of us got here in a vehicle. Most of us have jobs. There's, most of us are sitting with family. Or you have family you're going to go see afterwards. Not everybody. But a lot of us have good in our life. It's not all bad. And again, that we have any good in our lives, given the state of the universe, is an amazing thing that we can be grateful for. It's not all bad. Number five, things here, good or bad, will not last. The passage talks about all the days of my life. The psalmist says that we're, we're, our days are numbered 70 or 80 if we're strong. Ida had 93 years of life. And let me tell you, she was a pretty tough lady. I, I got to know her a little bit. Um, when she used to come here and worship with Karen, and my, my family was riding Karen's horses. My daughters were riding Karen's horses for a number of years and got to know her mom. And uh, she was a tough lady. I mean, 93-year-old polio survivor, she's got to be pretty tough, right? Well, she'd also ride the scooter, the motor scooter, down by the lake. And one time in her 80s, she d took a dump and tumbled off the scooter. She gets up and wipes herself off, and like Larry Moss, you know. I'm oh, good. 80 years old. And uh, then... The, then she also, at Aurora Ponds, at the nursing home where she was, she would drive her electric wheelchair so fast around corners that she would tumble out of the wheelchair. And her kids tried to dial down the speed settings, but she'd always turn them back up. And I'm told that she never broke a bone or needed surgery in all those tumbles that she took as an old lady. She's pretty tough. Regardless of how many days you have, they are numbered. Ida's time was up this past week, 93 years. We don't know how many days we got, but we have numbered days. We have to be sure that we're not getting too comfortable with the good things that we have in this world or making idols out of them. We don't want to get carried away enjoying this world. This world is not our home. We're just passing through. Amen? But this is also truth of great comfort to those brothers and sisters in the persecuted church who it costs them dearly just to worship. It costs them dearly to have faith. They're exiled. They're ostracized from family. They're persecuted, physically beaten, tortured. For them to know that this is not it. This is not all there is. Which brings us to the next verse, uh, and the next point, God's good presence is eternal. We'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I think this, is, this was Ida's testimony. Though her circumstances were often bad, and there was much loss the days of her life, she had a relationship with this God who was present with her. And in him, she would dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And that's what she wanted preached to the people at her funeral. That was the promise that she staked her life and her death upon. Dwelling in the house of the Lord forever. So there are six points, six ways we can talk about God's goodness when things often seem so bad. But the seventh uh, point I want to talk about is, what does it mean for us? Uh, I've been talking about God's goodness, but we're called to be good too. What does it look like for us to be good? Goodness is one of the fruits of the Spirit, that if we're filled with the Spirit, goodness, our lives will emanate goodness. And so what I want to, I want to suggest to you is that God's goodness is revealed in our godliness or our God-likeness. The more we bear the image of God, the better we bear the image of God, the more God's goodness is revealed in our own life. 
And there's a couple different ways that I want to suggest. First, that we are trusting of God in our sufferings. Because it's going to happen. When we are suffering, that we have in the back of our head from long ago this idea that God is good and all things work together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose, Romans 8, 28. If we can understand that God has got a bigger thing going on and we can trust him in our sufferings, because ultimately that's being Christ-like because that's what Christ did, right? When Christ was on the cross suffering, he had an understanding that the Father was carrying out a bigger plan and purpose through his suffering. So when we understand that in our suffering, we are being Christ-like. When we are trusting in God. Now, the circumstances can be terrible, and often they are. But if we are trusting God and His goodness, our trust reveals God's goodness to the people around us. Second way that I think we can reveal or display God's goodness is by being with people in their suffering. Whether it's making them a meal or just sitting with them or whatever. Uh, Ida celebrated a God who was with her in her sufferings. For us to be God-like, we then can sit with people in their sufferings, whatever they may be. The same article that I found the other uh, stuff uh, from earlier, I'm going to share with you in this regard as well. In the darkness, acting in, God, in God-likeness, we can comfort those who are suffering with the loving comfort we have received from God. You find that in 2 Corinthians. Romans says we can grieve with them. Job says we sit in the ashes with them. Galatians says we bear one another's burdens. And most of all, we lovingly point them to Jesus, the one good person who suffered the greatest of all evils to redeem us, who wipes away our tears, and who promises a day when this will all be fixed. When people are grieving and suffering, we don't necessarily approach them with the head knowledge of God's sovereignty First, we sit with them and suffer with them. In, as, as the suffering wanes and they start asking questions, the heart and the mind wants to know why. It goes back to the question. Why do bad things happen to good people? Or how can we talk about goodness when things seem so bad? Well, we have six things, seven things that we talked about this morning that we can use to equip ourselves to face the badness of this world with the goodness of our God. We began by singing uh, Psalm 100 this morning. And it says, Psalm 100, verse 5, For the Lord is good, and His love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Let's pray together. Father God, thank you for being good despite rough circumstances. Lord, uh, we know that life is difficult, and we see around us suffering. We've experienced suffering ourselves. But Lord, give us trust in a God who is good and who is ever-present, who walks with us through our difficult times. And Lord, may your goodness show through us, through our trust in you and our presence with those who are also suffering. We ask it in the name of our good Lord, who gave himself for our good salvation. In his name we pray, like God's people say, amen. At this time we're going to take our offering, we're going to pass baskets around, uh, and you can put your offering in there while we're singing this next song. And uh, if you're new visiting with us this morning in your program, there's a little tear-off piece where you can fill out your name and address, tell, it, tell us how it is that you got to be with us this morning. Uh, we hope that you feel welcome to with us. And so when the basket comes around for our members to take the offering, you can put that slip of paper in there at that time.
We invite you to uh, join us for a time of fellowship out there through the double doors. We'll have some coffee and cookies there. And if you need prayer, I think uh, our intercessor this morning, someone lined up, meet someone here. I'm not sure who that's going to be. Um, but hear this blessing of the Lord. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Have a beautiful week.